Well, good morning. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Temple. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I want to read a set of scripture from Luke chapter 24. It says in verse 46, Jesus talking to his disciples, and Jesus said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send my promise of the Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until, you, until ye be endued with the power from on high. And he led them out as far as to Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for what you just read this morning. Jesus Christ was there instructing his disciples, giving them one final word of encouragement, one final uh, set of instructions, and telling them exactly what to do, Lord. We thank you for Jesus Christ instructing us and correcting us in our lives for your constant word of correction, Lord, blessing us and, and having its will and way in our lives. We pray that you would continue to watch over and bless this body of believers here at Trinity Baptist Temple. Well, we thank you for the opportunity to come and worship. Lord, just like these first disciples, they went away with great joy and were continually praising your name. Lord, I pray that that would be us this morning. That we would have great joy in our salvation. Great joy in our God who created us. Great joy in, in the time together this morning to come and worship your precious and holy name. Lord, bless these services in a mighty, mighty way. I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll stand with us this morning as we sing. we 
bow at his throne. Jesus, the Lamb of God, Savior and King, you alone, worthy of our praise forever. After that second song, I just want to go back to the first song and tell him hallelujah. Thank you for all you've done. What an amazing God Amen. we serve. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you for members for being in your place. If you're a guest, a returning guest, thank you for coming back and visiting with us again. 
And if you're a first-time visitor, thank you so much for being here. We consider you our honored guest. If you need anything, see one of these guys in the gray jacket, so right out front. There's a welcome center. There'll be someone out there that'll answer any questions you might have, meet any needs you might have. Just be a blessing to you. We're going to pray and bless the offering at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we do ask that you would bless this offering in a mighty, mighty way. Lord, that you would take it and you would use it for your honor, for your glory. Lord, as you see fit to further your kingdom, to further your gospel, or that more souls would be changed, more lives would be changed, more souls would be saved. That's our heart. It's our desire here at Trinity Baptist Temple. And we thank you for continually putting that in our minds and in our hearts, Lord. And we pray that uh, we would just continue to serve you until you come, until you call us home. In Jesus' name, amen.
the victory in Jesus. All right, everyone, please stand and join us in victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning, when I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He fought me and he bought me. Love me. 
Then in glorious morning I shall see I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side And His smile will be the first I shall know Him, I shall know Him And redeemed by His sign I shall stand I shall know Him, I shall know
stick to the table of the Lord. He says, come just as you are to his table. Amen. Well, good morning to everybody. It's good to see y'all here. Welcome, as Brother Jeffrey said, all of our guests. And uh, I just want to reiterate, if you're a first-time guest, we're, we're thankful that you came this morning uh, to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, if there's anything you can, we can do while you're here, uh, please let us know, and, and we'll do our best to, to serve you. If you have your Bibles, you can turn over to 2 Kings chapter 7. As you're turning there, I just want to share, next week we will not have Sunday school. We will have our morning worship service at 1030. You'll see that also in your bulletins. 1030, morning worship service for Mother's Day. Uh, we'd love to see all you uh, mothers and daughters and uh, to celebrate uh, the blessing uh, that God has given to us in that. So I want to share a quote this morning. Hudson Taylor, great missionary to China, once said, Do not have your concert first. And then tune your instrument afterwards. Begin the day with the word of God and prayer. And get first of all into harmony with him. This morning, uh, we're going to continue our study, uh, returning to God and looking at the reward phase uh, of this study. But I want to look specifically at being in tune with God versus being out of tune with God. And then also I want to see uh, some, some lessons from some lepers uh, that can teach us some things in that as well. So let's pray, and we'll jump right in. Father, we come before you. We thank you for allowing us to be here, God. Thank you for allowing us to worship you. God, you're worthy of every word we could utter, every song, every song we could sing, every note we could play. God, you're worthy of all the praise and more uh, that we could give you. And, and so, Lord, we, we're thankful that we have had this opportunity uh, to lift up our voices and, and, and thank you and praise you through song, and now, Lord, I ask that you would just use me as a vessel. As your word is preached, God, that, Lord, at this time, every person here, myself included, Lord, we would open our spiritual ears if we have, Lord, our spiritual eyes if we have, Lord, and to hear and see what you have uh, for us. And, God, if there is someone here that's lost and has never entered into a relationship with you through faith in Jesus Christ, God, I pray this morning they will see the great importance of having faith in you, of being in tune with you. Um, and, and God, I also pray that we as Christians would see the great importance of living our lives with the rhythm that you, you've already created. Lord, being in tune with you and experiencing the very best of what you, you've offered to us and, and, and that lays out there for us. And so God, we ask again that you bless now and uh, just have your way. We'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've shared this before, um, that, that we, we plan everything, typically everything in our lives. We schedule it in, and we live our lives with that. I was talking to someone about this just last week, and, and uh, I, I'm, I'm bad. I, I need that. I, I need to have stuff on my calendar, and I tell people all, all the time, like, email me. I need to see it before me. I need to be able to put it on my, on my schedule and, and, and stuff like that, and that's just my shortcomings. I I wish I could remember everything everybody says and everything that I'm supposed to do and when I'm supposed to do it, but um, we schedule. We, we even schedule our lives according to the schedules that other people give to us. I'll give you an example. Avery plays volleyball for the Y, and um, guess we don't just tell them when we want to play volleyball. Uh, they give us a schedule. They say, here it is. This is when practice is going to be. This is when the game is going to be. And then we integrate that into our schedule. Now, of course, that that goes in, 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 in to, to factor whether it fits into our lives. If it doesn't fit into our lives, then we don't do it. Uh, and we'll talk, most, uh, talk, talk about that in just a second. Um, but most of the time, for most of us, uh, it's not that we, we can't do certain things uh, that are given to us in our schedule or, or, or things that um, could be scheduled. It's this, just the simple fact that we don't schedule it or we don't accept the hiccup in our schedule. We don't accept the hiccup and the rhythm that we desire in our schedule. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today. But uh, honestly, if we were to, to say, 
here's how I feel. I think all of us, uh, for the most part, would say, I desire a certain amount of rhythm in my life. Even if, if, if people like the spontaneity that life throws at them, even if people like to keep things stirred up and crazy, there's still a desire, even in that, to have rhythm in that. Um, and so, I, again, I believe we all have that in us, that desire, where just everything clicks and, it, and, it, and it's in sync with how we're wired or, or what we want in our life. But the sad truth is, is that in our failure to, to schedule, to appropriate the necessary time to the vital things in our life and, and our maybe even reluctance to interrupt the, the rhythm that, that we create for ourselves, we can be living a life that's, that's so out of tune and so out of sync with God that we miss out on the great things that God has for us in this life. You know what can happen when we're out of tune with God, when we're out of sync and even out of rhythm with God? Just to put it musically, it's happened to me several times before, playing the guitar, strings out of, out, out of tune, play the wrong note. It just happened a few months back. I put the capo on the wrong spot and everybody started going, and I hit the right chord. Everybody else played the wrong one. And, um, and immediately, it, it throws everything off. It, it, it throws the rhythm of the whole thing. Everybody, what is going on? Being out of tune like that throws it out of rhythm. Same thing, I've had it before to where strings have broken and, and, and in the middle of a song, and, and it doesn't alter the tune enough or being in tune the guitar enough to, to, to change anything up. And so just keep playing with one string dangling and stuff. And, and so uh, that's happened. But it's also happened to where it so alters the tuning. If it's a larger string that has more tension on the neck, that it, it changes the tune enough that it just, oh, man, that's ugly. Man, that just went like a, a half step down or a whole step down, and it's just bad. So um, again, when, when we're out of tune like that, uh, musically, it, it, it abruptly alters the rhythm. It changes the flow and ultimately can kill the song itself. If you're talking musically, the joy that's in that song and the worship even that's being uh, given through that song. Just by being out of tune and then getting out of rhythm, it just, it, it, it alters it. Things truly become a mess. And that's the reality even in our spiritual lives. When we're out of tune with God and we get out of rhythm and out of sync with, with what God desires, man, things become a mess. I want to look at that this morning again. I want to look at being in tune with God versus being out of tune with the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 7 is where we pick up our study. It says in verse 1, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. So very clearly this is what God has given to Elisha. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. So, again, we've been seeing this great famine in Samaria up to this point. We looked at that last week and saw how desperate t that times were, how many shekels of silver that just a donkey's head went for, and, and how much just a, a pint of dove's dung went for. Just uh, absurd in, in, in what was going on, but it showed the dire conditions there. Now, the prophecy comes through Elisha saying, okay, God's going to bless. It's going to get back to, to, to a better time of a measure of fine flour for a shekel, and two measures of barley. So look at verse 2. Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? Wow. So what is he asking there? He's saying, look, look around. Look how bad things are. And you're saying just tomorrow? This, it's all going to be better? I mean, if God made windows in heaven, would that even be possible? Well, could that be possible that God could just change things just like that? He could make windows in heaven and everything be, be completely better. Now look what happens in the rest of that verse. And he said, this is Elisha talking to him, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. Man, you want to talk about windows in heaven, you're going to see it, but you won't be able to eat thereof. But right away, we have an example in, in this Lord on whom the king 
leaned, his hand he leaned on, an example of being out of tune with God. A, 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 an example of, of being completely out of touch. He questions the ability, even the, the, the capability of what God can do. And I think it goes even further than that to question the care for God in this question. Obviously, he doesn't have faith in the Lord. He says, it, look, if God can make windows in heaven, I, I doubt that this could be. And I believe it was also in his heart, just as it was in the, in, in the king's heart before, even if God could do that, he obviously doesn't care. Look at what's going on around us. He also, in my opinion, and according to our text, doesn't realize the condition that they're in and, and, and the purpose that they're in it. Why they are in this state. He's, he's living maybe disconnected from reality and, and just moping through and, 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 and drudging through this, this famine. As I said, just like the, the, the king of Israel, Remember the woman, on, on, as he was walking on the wall, she cried out, help me. His, his question, listen, if God isn't helping, then how can I help you? Again, questioning what God can do. This Lord is out of tune. He's, again, he's out of rhythm, out of touch. And I would presume, and this is not a lot of presumption on my part, but I, I would think that this Lord hasn't even considered that he might be a little part of the problem. His own, the state of his own heart the place that he is in his life, I, I, I believe that's what he was doing. He was looking around, and, 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 and just like most of the time, when we get out of touch with God, I believe he began to find it easier to look around at others. And, and, and what we see here, even questioning God. It's easy to do when you're out of tune. It's easy to do when you're out of tune with God and out of touch with, with God and out of sync and out of rhythm. It's easy to, to look around at others. And point fingers and find scapegoats. Satan, that's easy for him. As soon as we disconnect, as soon as we get out of tune, that's easy for Satan. Again, I don't think that this, this Lord has considered possibly, just possibly, that he's part of the problem. And in that, he's done nothing to be part of the solution. He's looking at what's going on, and, and, and he's just kind of wallowing in this. He hasn't repented. He hasn't turned to God. He hasn't sought the Lord. He hasn't called out to him. He hasn't done anything to help turn the tide. He said, yeah, but the king himself was out of tune with God. What was this Lord supposed to do? Go against the flow? If the king, absolutely. If he had realized that he was part of the problem or that he was out of sync with God, out of tune with God, out of rhythm with God, he at that point in time should have repented and said, God, help us. And when Elijah spoke the word from God, he should have said, yes, God can do it, but we've got to repent. We've got to get in sync. We've got to get in tune with God. But he doesn't do that. So now in this out of tune state that he's in, he's questioning the servant of God as well. He's questioning God. He's questioning the servant of God. And that's when we see what Elijah said. Elijah reveals what God will do in his amazing grace yet again. In this, in this state where the children of Israel were just completely out of tune and out of sync with God, God still shows what he can do in his amazing grace once again. So what's his, what's his reward for this refusal to be in tune? What's his reward for this, this, this refusal to be out of sync and to be out of rhythm with God, to, to be in this state of unbelief. What is the reward? He'll miss out on the very blessings that come from the hand of God. These blessings that God gives in his amazing grace. He's going to see them, but he can't taste of them. I want to share this morning, that's exactly the truth. That's exactly the case even today. Again, did you hear what the reward was? Did you, did you hear what his, his, his judgment was going to be because of his unbelief? Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. You know what this is? It's the same reward for unbelief that has been from the beginning of sin. It's, it's the same reward for unbelief and being out of sync with God that we see even from Adam and Eve. What happened with Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve, because of their unbelief, they questioned God, they disobeyed God, 
And because of that, the Bible says they were cast out of the garden. They knew where the garden was. They were just cast out. God didn't send some type of fog over them and not know where the garden was. They didn't forget what it was like inside the garden. They, they knew where the garden was. They remembered what it was like to walk in fellowship with God, to be in tune, to be in sync with God. But because they're unbelief, because of sin, they were cast out and they saw it, but they just couldn't experience it anymore. We could talk about the people in Noah's day. What happened? Noah was preaching, was warning them of the, uh, of the flood to come. But because of their unbelief, what, what, what happened to them? They saw that ark, and when the flood began to, to, to rise above the level that they could sustain their own selves anymore, they began to want to be inside where the blessings were, where the protection was. But because of their unbelief, they, they were able to see what the blessing was like, but they didn't experience the blessing. We could continue on and talk about Moses. And the first wave of the children of Israel that were wandering in the wilderness. And, and because of their unbelief, the Bible says that they didn't get to enter into the promised land. Remember, they, they saw it. They knew what it was like. They heard the report. But they saw it and they couldn't experience that land that flowed with milk and honey. Jesus tells a story in the New Testament of, of the rich man and Lazarus. And we're told what happens in their lives, one because of belief and one because of unbelief. Lazarus goes to Abraham's bosom and he's comforted there, but the rich man, because of his unbelief, is there and in hell lifting up his eyes, being in torment, could see Lazarus afar off, comforted in Abraham's bosom. But guess what he couldn't have? He couldn't have that blessing. He saw it, but he couldn't taste of it because of his unbelief. And again, today and one day at the judgment seat of Christ, the same thing will happen. People will see the amazing, and people now even are seeing blessings of God. But many are missing out on it. And that day again at the judgment, people will, will, will realize, man, we could have, but because of unbelief, won't get to have that eternal life in heaven. Again, because of unbelief. Sadly, out of tune. But it's that way for Christians, too. Not about heaven or hell, but about the blessings of God. Even Christians, maybe even in this congregation this morning, can miss out on the fullness of God's blessings in this life. And not only the blessings in this life, but the rewards in the next. Because of being out of tune. Because of unbelief. And to do so, I say, how? How, how, how is this possible? I believe it's to neglect and refuse the tools and the blessings that God has already afforded to us as his children. The Holy Spirit in us, the word of God before us, men and women of God in our lives around us, faith that we receive from hearing the word of God. All of these tools, all of these blessings that God has given to us in our life to be in tune with him so that we can live a life that's in sync and in rhythm with him, experiencing all of the blessings that he desires to give to his children. So I believe it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking if you or I are out of sync and out of, out of tune with, with the Lord. And the reason why I think it's heartbreaking is because I think it's unnecessary for us to do that. I think it's unnecessary for the children of God to be out of tune with Him when He's given us His Holy Spirit living inside of us. As I said a while ago, His, His Word, the guide, the wisdom all before us. And it, it, again, it's unnecessary. For us to be out of sync and out of tune. Can you imagine being a part of a body? But it's like you're standing on the outside looking in. Looking at all what the body's able to experience, but you can't experience it. Not being able to partake in the blessings. I would say that would be miserable. Miserable. And unnecessary. And I'll share this morning, this is simply a heart and a faith issue. It's a heart and a faith issue. Looking from the outside in is something that our next group, these lessons from these lepers that we're going to learn, they were very familiar with. They experienced it on a daily basis. And I want to learn some lessons from these lepers because they give us, a very good, uh, they give us some very good instructions on being in sync. And, and, and some of the things that, that are associated with that. So in, in our text, look back with me. It says in verse 3, There were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate, and they said to one another, 
why sit we here until we die? So we're just sitting at the gate, and we're just going to sit here and die. Why are we doing this? If we say, we determine, we'll enter into the city, then the famine's in the city, and we're going to die there. But if we sit still here, we die also. It's a lose-lose situation. So what's the other option? Now, therefore, come, let us fall unto the host of the Syrians, and if they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall die. Interesting. An interesting tape. You've got, you got these four leprous men sitting at the, the gate of, of the city of Samaria, and, and, and there's a reason why they're there. They're not allowed there inside, but they say in their minds, listen, if we just go against the flow, we go inside of the city, we're going to die there anyways because there's nothing in the city. There's a famine going on, a great famine. But if we just sit here outside the gate with, with nothing and no one, we're going to die here too. So our only option is to move. Our only option is, is, is to, to go out and put ourselves on the line. There's only two options. Either we're going to be sustained and we'll experience blessings and we'll live, or we'll go out there and die the same. I think something needs to be said about their discontent to just sit and die, though. They, they were not okay with just continuing to sit where they were and die. And we can debate this morning about whether this was foolish or this was them being full of faith. Nevertheless, the reality was they were discontent to just sit and exist. And my prayer would be that for every member of Trinity Baptist Temple to have that same discontent to just sit and exist. I pray that every, mem- every, every part of Trinity Baptist Temple would say, I'm not okay with just existing in this life. I'm not okay with just showing up and then leaving. I'm not okay with sitting and existing, just waiting to die. We have one life to live for Jesus Christ. We have one opportunity in this life to give him our everything. And I want to say this morning, the life of blessings, the life of the fullness of the blessings of God is never experienced just by sitting and existing. That's not where the fullness of the blessings are. That's not where, where God, where you'll experience the fullness of a relationship with God and everything that comes along with that. That's not where you'll find it, just passing the time. So yeah, but I, I do that. I, I come and I sit and I, I just, I, I'm just a part. I, I don't do anything. I'm not, I'm not necessarily in tune or out of tune. I'm just existing. Then I'm telling you now. You say, yeah, but I feel like I'm, I'm being blessed. You're not experiencing the fullness of God's blessings. That's just the reality. And if someone could tell you it could be so much better, wouldn't you want that? And say, no, I'm good. No, let me put it to you in in, in tangible terms then. If someone told you that you could, if you will just, if you'll just exist the way you are, you can have a million dollars. I'm good. That'd take care of me for the rest of my life. But you could have $10 million if you move. Oh, wait a second. That's a game changer. One million versus 10 million. What if it was even upped higher than that? A hundred million. Whoa. Now we're talking. Now we're talking about tangible things. But listen, the Bible says that the things on this earth can be touched by moths and rust. They can be tainted and one day they will be destroyed. But there are blessings and there are rewards that are spiritual in nature, that are eternal in nature, that cannot be touched with moth or rust. Neither can they be destroyed. And those things are only accessed and those things are only given to those that are in sync and in tune with the Lord. Those that are not just sitting and existing. Those who are not just just buying their time waiting to die. Again, I don't know about you, but if I'm given that option, I choose the more. I choose the fuller. See, yeah, it's just too hard, though. No, God's given us all the tools and blessings. It's a matter of the heart 
and a matter of faith, as I said a while ago. Look at verse 5. So they have this discussion among themselves, but what do they do? After they talk, was it just a bunch of talk, or did they actually do something? Verse 5, they rose up. There you go. They, they did something. In the twilight, to go into the camp of the Syrians, and when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. That's interesting. What happened? Verse 6 tells us, for the Lord had made. Wow. God had gone before them. God had prepared the way. God had done something that man couldn't do. He said, how do you know that? Read further. The host of the Syrians, he made them hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great army, a great host. These Syrians were, were afraid of their life, for their lives. They were shaking in their boots. And they said to one another, lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the king of the Hittites and the king of the Egyptians to come upon us. I don't know if you understand what he's saying there, but he's saying, listen, they have a, a continental army here. They've got the Egyptians. They've got the Hittites. It's not just the children of Israel. And what's going to be important about that is what we're going to see in just a second, what the children of Israel truly have. But God had made the Syrians to hear the noise of an army that Israel had no, not even close to that number, not even close to that. But God had made them to hear that. So verse 7, wherefore they arose, thinking that this was going on, and fled in twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses and even the camp as it was and fled for their lives. So you can see what's going on here. Here it is at nighttime and all of a sudden they hear horses and chariots and they have all this, this, this panic rise up in them and in their fear, they just run. They, they don't they don't collect $200. They don't do nothing. They, they run. They, they are scared for their lives. They weren't prepared. They weren't ready to fight. Besides that, this, what they heard was terrifying. It was way more than what they knew they could handle. So they run. They leave it all. This is what the, the lepers come upon. I want to ask a question this morning. Do you think that when the lepers moved in faith or moved to action, do you, do you think that they knew that God would go before them in this way? Do you think the lepers knew that God would be showing them favor and providing for them in this way when they moved? I don't think so. Because what they said was, hey, what's it, we're going to stay here and die, we're going to go in the city and die, or we can go into the camp of the, the, the Syrians and if they spare our lives, we'll live. But if not, we're going to die. They, they didn't think that there would be no one there. They didn't think that everything would still be in camp for them to partake in. They, they did not think that's how God was going to provide. They didn't know. But they moved to action. So I want to learn, I want to take some lessons from these four lepers this morning. And see how we can... We can take it in, in its practical application, even in our lives today. The first thing I want to look at is this. The lepers had a disease. They had a problem. There, there, was, there was an issue in their life that would end up costing them their life. It was a disease. And so they said, we're going to sit at this, day, this gate and lie or, and die because of our disease, because... This is, this is the reality. And the second thing in this, in this condition, this leprous, this disease condition, I want you to also understand that they were separated, not only from God, but they were separated from people. They were separated from the children of Israel. They were outsiders. They were outcast. They weren't connected. The third thing is that they determined, I believe, to move in faith, to lay it all on the line. I know that you could go either way. I, I know that you could say that they were, just, they were just shooting in the dark. They were gambling their lives. But I, I, I just ha have a, a belief that they were, they were trusting. They had faith. Something was moving them. And I believe it was their faith. You know what? We've got to lay it on the line. And the fourth thing that we've seen so far is God, in his grace, through their moving of faith, took care of the enemy that would destroy them. 
in, in their faith and because of God's grace, God went before them and took care of the enemy that would destroy them. Now look what happens in verse 8. When the, these lepers came into the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent. Can you imagine them like coming upon this camp and, and, and it's a ghost town. I mean, it, it looks like it's a wreck. It looks like, but everything is there except for the people. All the horses, all, 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 the, all the livestock, all the tents, all the possessions, maybe even fire still going. I mean, it, it's all in place, but nobody there. And the first thing they do is they, they, they walk into the camp. They see a tent, maybe they're along the outside perimeter, and they, they go into this tent to, to see what's in there. And they walk in there, and there is plenty of supply. They did eat and drink, and they carried then silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it. They had, they, they, they had arms full of all of these blessings. They ate, they were full, then they get all the, these riches, and they go and they hide it. But that's not the end. They come again and enter into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. So these lepers now, the fifth thing I want to look at is this. They experienced a treasure provided by God again through his grace. What if they had just stayed sitting at the gate? They would have died. But here they are experiencing these treasures of God through his grace. They wouldn't have otherwise had those treasures. They wouldn't have otherwise had those blessings. They wouldn't have otherwise experienced God's grace like this had they not moved in faith. But I also want you to notice in number six. They were filling themselves up. And not only that, they were concealing this treasure provided to them by God in his grace. They were filling themselves up. They were just consuming and eating and getting full. And then they were carrying armfuls of treasures and hiding them all for themselves. Man, they were living the, the, the abundant life. They were living a life full of blessings and treasure. And, and they, were, they were getting filled up to the brim. Yeah, they moved in faith. Yeah, they were experiencing all this by God's grace. They were the only ones experiencing this. They were, they were filling themselves up. When is enough enough? What is enough? Remember, the entire city of Samaria was starving. The entire city of Samaria was, was dying in their starved state. And here they were being selfish. Here, here they were taking everything that God had blessed them with and indulging and, and hiding it. Some of you may be familiar with the parable of the, the talents. There was one, one of the servants that received one talent. And Jesus tells the story that that one who received one went and hid it in the earth. And when the, the day of reckoning came, it says that the Lord was angry at that servant. So he went and hid it. It was something that was given to him by grace. It was something that was entrusted to him by God. It was a blessing that he did not earn. And God gave it to him. And he went and hid it. And here we have these, these lepers, man, experiencing the fullness of God's blessing here. They were selfish. Did it, did it click with them? Did, it, did, it, did this situation, did some, were they just completely fine to exist in this, this state? And man, we're just going to continue to do this. We'll, we'll go from tent to tent and we'll fill ourselves every day, day and night. We'll continue to store up all these treasures. We will be filthy rich. We'll go hide all this stuff. Listen, lepers, lepers redeemed now, we're, we're going we're gonna to be good. We're, we, we got it made. Listen, we may die, but we're going to die rich. How, how did they handle the situation? Verse 9, they said to one another, we do not well. We're not doing good. We're not doing the right thing. 
What got to them? They, they say what got to them. This day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. If we tarry to the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Did you hear what got a hold of them? They had good news. They had good news that they could share with the people that were starving and in need, with the people that were dying. They had the good tidings. They, they had it all in they in their, in their blessed state, in their abundant state, in their enriched state, they said, we're not doing good. We got all of this good news to share and we're holding our peace. We're keeping it to ourselves. Not only the blessings, but the news of the blessings. They were convicted. They knew, hey, if we continue in this selfishness, if we continue in this, this hiding of God's blessings, you know what's going to happen? We're going to be held accountable. We're going to have to answer for that. Does that sound familiar? It does to me. It reminds me of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, if our good news, if our good tidings... Be hid. It's hid to them that are lost, that are sick, that are dead, that are dying. In whom the God of this world is blind to the minds of them which believe not. Remember what I talked about go Heart, trust issue. That believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel, the good news of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. It reminds me further in chapter 5 of that same book. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. I'm talking about of the Lord. Why? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he had done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. We, are, we know we have the fear of God. We know the reality of standing for him on, on, at the judgment seat of Christ. We know all these things. Therefore, we go out and we persuade men. We, we, we beg them. That's our, that's our work. We're made manifest to you, and I trust also are made manifest in your cons. Listen, that's what we're doing, he says. We're, we're not hiding anything. We're not, we're not doing anything for any other reason, but because we know the terror of the Lord, and we go out and compel men. Look back in our text in verse 10. So they came and called into the port of the city. Wow, they didn't, they, so they moved again. They, they moved to action to go experience the blessings of God. Then in the blessings of God, being enriched in God, they didn't just talk. They didn't say, you know what, this is not a good thing. You know, we, we, we've got all these blessings. We should do something with this. Do you, do you know what's in, in, in tent C? They got fried chicken. I hadn't had fried chicken in a long time. And in tent D, I think they got some steaks underground in a little cool area. We could cook those. There's not enough for the whole city. Listen, why do we got to go do something? They didn't do any of that. They said, wait a second. How blessed are we? We need to go share this good news. We need to go give this good news to people in need. And verse 10 says that they did it. So they came and called the port of the city and they told them, saying, we came to the camp of the Syrians and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of a man. They weren't even screaming as they were running. We couldn't, they were long gone. But there were horses tied and asses tied. And the tents were left as they were. And he called the porters. And they told it to the king's house within. They shared the good news to those that were in need. To those that were depraved. To those that were dying. They shared it. They shared the good news. And it even reached the king's house, the Bible says. Who was the king? Remember, he was another person out of tune with God. He was another person because of unbelief, had, 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 had questioned God and, and, and was living completely out of tune. They were experiencing the devastating effects because of the king, because of the unbelief, because of the state of Israel. They were experiencing the devastating effects of being out of tune with God. And we're going to see what are some of these effects. Verse 12 shows us 
So the king who's out of tune, who hears the good news, arose in the night and said to his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done. Listen, I know what's going on here. You guys don't know. These lepers, they come back and, and listen, I know what's going on here. They know that we be hungry. Therefore, they're gone out of the camp and they're hiding themselves in the field, saying, when they come out of the city, we'll catch them alive and get into the city. Didn't you hear the good news? Did, didn't you hear the good tidings that the leper said? Listen, they're gone. God has provided. It's there. God has done this. But the king who's out of tune and out of sync had a different take on this. So what are some of the devastating effects of being out of tune with God? Revealed here, not just revealed here, but even throughout Scripture, even seen in our lives. Here are some. I have them on the screen. Assumptions. Presumptions. Conspiracies, bitterness, unbelief, and missed blessings. When we get out of tune with God, things go crazy. Things go crazy. Irrational thoughts, feelings, speech, actions, everything gets out of sync. Everything gets out of rhythm. When we're out of tune with God, our thoughts, our hearts, everything gets messed up. And that's what the king is. These guys just came and told him, look, this is amazing out here. God has provided. No, 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 no. There's unbelief. I know what's going on. They're, gonna, they're hiding themselves, and they're going to come in, and, and, and they're going to capture us, and then they're going to come into our city, and they're going to take it over. It can't be just that easy. That good news that you have, it can't be that easy just to, to, to experience the goodness of God just, just like that, just because God provided it. Some devastating effects of being out of tune with God. But on the flip side, when we're in tune with God, here's, here's some of the edifying effects when we are in tune with the Lord. Now, this is not exhaustive, just like the other list wasn't exhaustive. But when we're in tune with God, we have assurance. We have faith. We have trust. We also have peace. When we're in tune with God, we have joy no matter what happens. We have the fullness of the blessings of God. Again, because of faith. When we're in tune with God, you can go through what Job went through and still say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can, you, you can face anything in this life. When we stay in tune with God, we can have assurance. You know what? This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. When we are in tune with God, that's what abides in our life. And because of that, because we're in tune with God, it, it, the opposite is true as far as our thoughts, our speech, our feeling, our actions. They're all clear. And they're in tune with God being in tune with God versus being out of tune with God I believe is the difference of knowledge and understanding and on Wednesday nights the last two Wednesday nights I've been teaching on knowledge and understanding last Wednesday night I talked about understanding here's how I illustrate it it's just tangible it's not in the Bible but this is according to, to what God's word and how, how, how it is laid out knowledge would be like parts of a car understanding is like those parts put together in their proper order, working, making the car work, making the car move, do what it's supposed to do. And I share this, that there's a lot of people that have garages full of car parts, but no cars. Nothing's put together, nothing's working. There's a lot of the parts there, but it's not going. Those people, again, without understanding, out of sync, out of sync with the Lord. Again, that's why it's not okay just to come and sit and exist, just to collect parts, just to have all the, all the blessings, just to, just to exist and to the point that you die. No, because understanding, when those parts come together and you, you start moving, your life starts moving you in faith because you're not content to sit and just die. And you start experiencing blessings because of that understanding. You start seeing God's grace and his provision laid out in your life. You're in tune with God. You're in sync with God. And again, you can go through anything in this life because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 
And lo, he's with you always, even to the end of the world. Being in sync with God, being in tune with God is vital. Look at verse 13. And when his servants answered and said, Let some, some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Now look at this, for instance. Behold, they are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say that there, there are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. And let us send and say, listen, we, uh, we don't have an army anymore. All the horses have died, ex- except for these. Um, the famine has been so great. So remember back what God had called the Syrian army to hear? They thought that the Hittites and the Egyptians were hired with the Israelite army to consume them. And they're like, okay, um, go ahead and send those couple of chariots out there. And that's what verse 14 says. They took, therefore, two chariot horses, and, sent, uh, and, and the king sent after the host of the Syrians and said, go and see, check it out. They went after them under Jordan. They, they searched the whole area, and lo, all the way was full of the garments, of garments and vessels which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messenger returned and told the king, and the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. I've said it throughout this study. I'll continue to say it because God's word says it. If God says it, you can count on it. You can take it to the bank. Not only that, we're going to see it happen again. Verse 17. So almost uh, get ready to close. Here we go. And the king appointed the Lord on whose hand he leaned to have charge of the gate. Listen, this is crazy. We got to go out and get all this stuff and bring it back in. Hey, you stand at the gate. Make sure every, everybody's uh, on the same page. So the Lord, who had questioned God through Elisha, is now standing at the gate. The people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. Look at that next phrase. As the man of God had said, who spake when the king came down to him. And it came to pass that the man of God who uh, had spoken to the king, saying, two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel shall be tomorrow about this time in the gate of Samaria. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing, is this possible, if God even made windows in heaven? And he said, Behold, this is what Elijah said to him. It's just a refresher. Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. Verse 20, and so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. Once again, if God says it, you can take it to the bank. And that's what I'm sharing this morning about being in tune with God, about having the, heart, the right heart and having the right faith in our lives. It's essential, essential that our lives are tuned with the Lord. It's essential that our lives be in sync, in rhythm with God. But that takes effort. In that, it takes faith, just like those lepers. You know what? We can't just sit and die. Faith necessary for salvation. It's necessary to experience the blessings, the fullness of the blessings of God once we are saved. There's no other way to experience it. So my encouragement to you this morning is don't be found waiting on the outside. Don't be on the outside looking in, watching all the blessings of God, and not partaking of them, not being a part of them. Trust is the action needed to be in tune. Faithfulness is the key to staying in tune. But intonation or being in tune, that is the key element that keeps rhythm with God. I said in the very beginning, Hudson Taylor, listen, don't try to go out and have the concert before tuning your life with the Word of God and with prayer. This morning, if you're here and you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, I promise you one day, and this is with a heavy heart that I say this, but it's what God's Word says. If you don't surrender your life to Christ and trust Him for salvation, if you don't confess Him as your Savior and Lord, accepting His death on the cross as payment for your sin, believing His resurrection, that He is Lord over all, He conquered death in that. If you don't today trust Him for salvation, then again, with a sad heart, when you stand before the Lord, if you were to die today, you would be on the outside looking in for all of eternity. Never being able to experience the 
grace and blessings of eternal life with God. So I encourage you to come this morning. We have two ministers down here, and you can tell, you can just come down and say, you know what? I, I don't want to be in hell for eternity. I, 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 want to, I want to be a partaker of the blessings of God for all of eternity. And you come this morning and say, I want, to, I want to know how to be saved. I want to know how I can go to heaven when I die. And they'll show you out of God's word what God says. But Christians this morning, I hope that you and I learn some lessons from some lepers. Man, they were, they were given blessings by God's grace. They were given riches and abundant riches. They were, they were so abundantly blessed. But in that abundantly blessed state, they realized, man, we've got good news to share. And we're going to be accountable if we don't go back and share it with those in need. So just as they got up from that gate in discontent, they went back in discontent to share the good news. And I pray this morning no member of Trinity Baptist Temple is okay with being out of tune with God and just sitting and existing, but that every member would strive to be in tune and in rhythm, being a part of what God has called us to be a part of and then experiencing all the blessings that go along with it. So maybe this morning you come down to this altar this morning if you're a Christian and say, God, man, I've made my life tuned to what I want it to be tuned to. I've I've, I've been going with a rhythm of my own beat. And I feel like I am standing on the outside looking in. Other people leading people to the Lord. Other people sharing in the joy and the blessings of God. Other people a part of what's going on. I feel like I'm just out. Maybe just come down and say, God, here's my heart and here's my faith. Tune my life to you. To you. I want to experience it all. And I promise you, if you do that and you're sincere, you'll have it all. That's a promise of God. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for allowing us to be here again. Thank you for your word, God. It shows us over and over again that you are an amazing, loving God. God, your grace is seen all throughout Scripture. Lord, and even in your grace, even when we see judgment and correction even when we see accountability Lord it just proves over and over again your love and your desire for our good Lord this morning I pray if someone's lost they would come this morning to be born again to receive the gift of eternal life Lord for those of us who already have Lord I I, I ask that you would move the hearts of every member of Trinity Baptist Temple Lord, that we would long for that sync, that rhythm, to be in tune with you. We'd long for, for sharing the good news, the blessings that you've given to us. So Lord, we ask you to move now in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll stand as they sing this morning, I want to encourage you to come. Again, maybe just pray, God, tune my life with your heart.
waiting for me Amen. Well, thank you again so much uh, for being here this morning, and um, hope that you uh, walk away encouraged and challenged. I know I am with this message. Uh, it's easy for all of us to get uh, out, of, out of tune and out of sync, and uh, again, starting off every day, tuning our lives with God's Word and spending time with Him in prayer is vital, uh, and so I, I encourage you and exhort you to do that. I want to also in invite you back this evening. Uh, to our evening service tonight, um, we have that, and then also, uh, again, please uh, look in your bulletin for all the things that are going on this week, uh, just a reminder once again about Mother's Day, next week, the service is at 1030, no Sunday school, no PM service, but I do want to ask you also and invite you, um, in two weeks, on the 17th, um, we'll have normal um, morning service, but in the evening service, we're going to have a special uh, service. We're going to be baptizing that night. Uh, we're also going to be um, having a sending out service for the Riley family, uh, who God is allowing us to uh, uh, plant a church through. And so, uh, again, we we'll invite you there. That's the 17th. And then there's going to be a fellowship afterwards just to uh, love on them and even opportunity to sow into their lives and to sow into the, uh, uh, the work there. So, Again, I just want to invite you uh, to that. Hopefully, we'll see you guys here in a little bit. Uh, 5.30 is the evening service. Brother JT, if you'll come and dismiss us now. God bless you all, and we'll see you later. A couple announcements real quick. Um, the TBT Missionary Garage Sale will be in the parking lot May 30th. Um, that's a Saturday. If you could get with Sharon or James Blaine, they'll be having a meeting right here up front immediately after the service and the desires. Everything that's sold uh, during that garage sale is raising more money for missions, okay? So come and be a part of that. If you have something, maybe you can't make it, but you have something that you can donate to that. Just remember, it is for missions, it's for the furtherance of God's kingdom. So if you can be a part of that, please partake in that. Also, we have Iron Sharpening Iron this Tuesday. Uh, 7 p.m. up here. That's for if, if you're new or you're a visitor. That's for all of our men. We have a fellowship on Tuesday, the first Tuesday of every month. Brother Mike just reminded me of that. And uh, we get together, we have a Bible study, and we eat. Usually a lot. So um, it's Italian. So come and be a part of that. And also, we want to thank all of our first-time visitors. If this is your first time visiting with us, thank you so much for coming and being a part of our worship today. We hope you're blessed. And if you guys could stop by the Welcome Center before you leave, we have something for you. It's a, a gift just showing our appreciation for you visiting with us. And I think I got it all, so let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity for us to gather together. I pray, Lord, that we would be a people that are walking in tune with you, Lord, your desire for our lives. 
Lord, that not only that, but we would go and share the abundant treasure and the blessing you've poured out in our lives with others, Lord, pointing other people towards Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would do a great and mighty work. Use this local body for your glory and for your kingdom and help us to be a faithful people. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' heavenly name I pray. Amen.